Okay, so let's try to talk about something else, which is uh, logistic regression. If you have any questions in the previous parts, please uh, go ahead and ask before we go uh, to this part. Yeah. Okay, good. So a logistic regression, we would basically try to see what will happen if we have let's say two classes, let's say we have two classes, let's stick with the same example, that we have a class for cat and class for dog, okay? And, and instead of dealing with the classes and saying that this is label one and this is label, let's say zero, we really would like to have a kind of intuition about the probability or how certain we are about our classification. So why hat the predicted label with just something binary, okay? It could be one, it could be zero. And then you go ahead and compare this, compare this and say if it's not equal or equal to the true label Y, okay? But how would we go ahead and have like a certainty or a probability uh, or a confidence in our uh, classification? Okay, we can't think about certainty as something like this. If we have 0.1 certainty, then this would mean that the classification is still under half because half is in the middle, right, between 0 and 1. So 0.1 would mean that we are very certain that this is a duck, right? And if it's 0.9, this probability, this would mean we are very certain that this is a cat. Okay, and if we are about 0.6, this would mean, yes, it's a cat, but we are not very certain, okay, because it's this is near 0.5. Okay, is this idea clear? No, please explain. Okay, so, and instead of having 0 and 1, we would just think about this as having probabilities, okay? Oh. Okay, so instead of zero, you would think about this as zero being very confident that this class is a dog, okay, and one being very confident that this class is a cat, okay, oh. and then when we variate this, uh, this would give us a different confidence levels. So 0 0.5 would mean that we are very uncertain about our data. So visually, we can say that it's something like that. Okay, it's something like this. So if we have um, a sample falling very close to our decision boundary, we are not very certain from that sample. So let's say that this is class one and this is class zero. So of course our decision boundary would be in the middle between zero and one. So it would be 0 0.5. So if we have a probability for this sample, it should be something like 0 0.6 because it's very close to 0.5, but it's still higher than 0.5. And if we have a probability or a confidence in this one, it could be 0.99, okay? Because it's very far away. So it's, it's like a measure of distance between uh, our sample and the decision boundary. That's far away from it, then it's very uh, certain point. But this one, not so much, okay? So this one could be like 0.4 because it's lower than 0.5, but not very certain. And this one could be 0.001, okay? Because it's belonging to zero. It's very close to zero and it's very far uh, from the boundary, okay? Of course, I'm putting this as a confidence uh with respect to the label, okay, with respect to the label. But if I'm talking about this as a confidence in general, I would say that this is like 99% confidence. And this one is also 99% confidence, but it's just in the opposite direction, okay? Any questions on this part? Oh, no. Okay, good. So right now we have 
just mentioned that we need to do some variation on our data to have some intuition about the uh, probability of uh, our classification okay so from statistics people have came up with something quite nice they came up with a concept called the odd ratio okay what is the odd ratio the odd ratio is basically something that is a bit different from what we need to do right now but it's going to be very easy to take this odd ratio and manipulate it a little bit to get what we need okay so in the logistic regression we are basically doing binary classification meaning that we have two classes as i was just drawing okay and we have uh, we need to have like a sort of a of a sort of idea about uh, the classification outcome the probability okay so uh, we can think about this as trying to get our data as we were doing we get w transpose x so we have the z value we map it to 5z okay and right now we need to get this 5z this activation this activation function and instead of having this as a linear activation function as we were doing in the other line we are trying to get this value of z that is continuous because you are just multiplying the weights by the feature value so this value is continuous it ranges from minus infinity to infinity and we really need to take this value ranging from minus infinity to infinity and go ahead and make this a probability okay and make this range from zero to one and then and only then we will be successful into mapping the z value that we have from our classification okay into a probability okay so that's our goal so let's just keep it on the side so again our goal is to do what we were doing with the other line and get z but instead of having z value like this and having like a unit step function that we were having in the perceptron or having a linear activation function that we had in other line our objective is here different we take this continuous value we map it to a probability that ranges from zero to one okay Okay, so let's look at the odd ratio and see how this would be handy in uh, trying to come up with the activation function of uh, logistic regression. So the odd ratio is basically defined as p over 1 minus p. Okay, the odd ratio is a quantity that takes a probability, probability something that ranges from zero to one and it tries to map it to something else okay it maps it to something else so if we take the value of probability to be zero then this would be zero over one minus zero okay which will give us zero okay and if we take the value of the probability to be one then this would be one over one minus one and this would give us infinity okay so the odd ratio is basically how to take a probability and map it to something that would range from zero to infinity okay so that's a famous way of mapping a probability into a range like that okay but this is so different, it's still so different from what we're trying to do. Again, remember, we need to take this range, minus infinity to infinity, and map it to a probability. So we almost need to do the opposite, and not just the opposite. We have minus infinity to infinity, and this is zero to infinity. Okay, so it's different. So let's try to do some manipulation to this in order to get our uh, our function okay and i'm also trying to like explain the function and why we are doing this and instead of just writing down the function or the equation because then it's just 
it would be just memorizing the equation and instead of knowing where it came from okay so let's try to manipulate this let's try to put it in that format that we wanted to have okay so let's try to manipulate this range to have the range from minus infinity to infinity okay let's look at one very handy function that will help us doing that okay we have a function which is the log the log looks like this the log looks like this the log of one will give us zero okay and let's say that this is x and this is log of x okay why this is so handy because if you think about it log of zero equals minus infinity right yeah. log of zero would equal minus infinity okay so if we take the log of this we would be changing this range from zero to infinity okay of zero to infinity to minus infinity to infinity okay so if we take the log okay by the way this is for the base e it could be for a different base but this is like a standard uh, way of doing this so we take the log of this ratio of this odd ratio okay so we take the log e of p over one minus p okay any problems in that no. okay perfect so right now we can think about this in a slightly different way how because we know that this right now would range from minus infinity to infinity right so what did we have that ring that was ranging from minus infinity to infinity it was z right so we can say that this is z because it would range from minus infinity to infinity so we can say that our z ranging from minus infinity to infinity would be equal to that okay and then we can manipulate this further because again the aim is to know the activation function okay the aim is to map something continuous z to something that would be a probability so it should range from zero to one that's our range okay so we need to come up with this activation function okay so we need to know the mapping between z and 5z the mapping between z and the probability so we can say that this equals e to the power of z okay e to the power of z would equal this quantity you can say e to the power of z would equal p over one minus p right from that we can just multiply them we can see that e power of z minus p e to the power of z okay would equal p right any problems in that okay perfect and then you can do other manipulations right you can take the probability uh, as a common okay or you can take e to the power of z as common so if we take the probability as common it will be a little bit uh, a little bit different okay but in the meantime we can just pause for a second and appreciate how good this log function is helping us uh, doing that so for the log function we take this zero map it to minus infinity but i actually would like to talk about the log function just very briefly on how we can use it in a very a slightly different way okay but very beneficial in our data just before we uh, we continue with the activation function i don't want to leave the look function like that because the look function would actually be 
very good in doing uh, some other stuff as well because with the look function assume that you have you have your data looking like that you have your data looking like that what you would notice that this data is not following a normal distribution a normal distribution would have a shape that looks like this okay so we would have a lot of samples in the middle and very few samples on the side okay so a normally distributed data should look like that they are really concentrated in the middle and then as you go far from the middle it's looking like that okay so that's the normal uh, distribution okay or the data is normally distributed and this assumption of normality is very essential to a lot of algorithms okay so we really need this assumption uh, of normality when we are uh, having uh, this kind of uh, way of thinking about our data okay so the look is very handy because if we have our data looking like that then like this then the distribution of this data looks very weird it would look like this we would have a lot of samples here so a lot of samples here and then some samples here so like looking like that and then just one sample here so something very few like that okay so this is this is far away from being normal distribution this is not a gaussian distribution okay this is something very skewed towards the extreme values this value or this value okay so what the log can really do when plugged in into these values when we take the log of these features that it would really correct the values of these features how just look at this when the x value is very high the log would be here right okay so it will try to bring the values close together if they are of a high numerical value for high scaling because if this value is high let's say 1000 okay and this is 500 okay on x the difference between them after taking the log will not be very high and you can test this yourself like take the log of 1000 and the log of 500 and you will notice that the gap between them is very small okay so now the advantage of taking the log that you are narrowing down this gap between the high scales or high values okay so you are bringing this value together okay into this part okay into these values into the middle basically okay and you are doing quite the opposite for the values that are lower than one look at look at the values lower than one now if the value is 0 0.9 and 0 0.8 on the actual scaling of the data, the difference between them was just 0.1. But on the log scale, on the log scale, the difference gets very big. Okay. Okay. When they are uh, lower than one. Okay. So this would mean that the log, when we apply it on this data, it will just try to separate this data, separate this data further apart. So this effect would basically mean that we are bringing this extreme data to the middle and having more data in the middle, okay? And scattering these data points that were very congested into this part, very dense in this area uh, for the report. And thus we would have something that could closely uh, be a normal distribution, okay? So I think that's handy. That's really handy with our data because a lot of the time we see that our data is not uh, distributed in this way, okay, such that we really uh, would uh, like to have our data to be uh, normally uh, distributed. Okay, so any questions in this part? Uh -huh. Okay, okay, perfect. So right now, I need you to try to think about how would we um, get what we need basically from this.
uh, port, basically get a probability uh, from the equation that we had uh, here. So we will continue to do this right now. Okay, I just want you to try to think about it um, very quickly. It it shouldn't be it shouldn't be very hard, I think. Okay, but I will just give you like a minute. Okay, to try to think about how to get this. Again, remember, we need to take the value of z, map it to phi of z, map it to a probability. So we need to take value that is continuous, map it to a probability. So we need to change this equation to be p equals something that is continuous. Okay. I don't understand the question. So, in this part, what did we want to do? We wanted to take this value, right? What is an activation function? Activation function takes the value of z, maps it to phi of z, right? So what we need to do, we need to take the value of z, which is continuous. It's from minus infinity to infinity. And we need to map it to a probability. That's why we were saying that this is confidence or certainty, right? So we need to take the value of z, and instead of having it from minus infinity to infinity, we need it to be a probability. So we need a function. This function will take something continuous that can range from, from minus infinity to infinity. That would range from 0 to 1. So it would be something like this. It will take any value from minus infinity to infinity, and will just map it to value from 0 to 1. Okay, so we started manipulating the equation of the odd ratio until we got to the point that, that we had this uh, ratio from minus infinity to infinity, and then we put our z value. So right now we need one thing. We need to further manipulate this to be something like this. P equals something that has z in it, such that when we plug in the value of the z value, let's say minus infinity, minus infinity should give us zero probability. And when we plug in infinity, this should give us one probability. Is this clear? Okay, so, okay, let's try to do it together. But at least do you get what we are aiming for? Okay. So we stopped at this equation. So let's bring it to the to the other slide. Let's bring it to this slide and try to think about it like in the same context because we stopped and talked about the look a little bit. So let's try to make it um, into one flow. So we said that we have the odd ratio equals p over one minus p. Again, our main objective, our main objective is to take z which is ranging from minus infinity to infinity, try to map it to a probability, okay, which ranges from zero to one, okay? We saw that this ratio ranges from zero to infinity, okay? And if we take the log of that ratio, this would mean that we would range from minus infinity to infinity, so we take the look of the other side as well. Okay. And by definition, what ranges from minus infinity, infinity is what we are looking for. It's Z. So Z equals log E, E over one minus P. Okay. And then what we can do, we can take e to the power of z to be equal to this quantity. So we can say e to the power of z equals p over 1 minus p, okay? And then we can just multiply 
the sides like that, so it will be e to the power of z minus p e to the power of z equals p, right? And then we can bring this to the other side, right? We can bring this to the other side. We can say that e to the power of z equals p plus p e to the power of z, right? And then from this, we can take p as common. So we can say e to the power of z equals p as common, okay? 1 plus e to the power of z, true. And then we can say p equals e to the power of z over 1 plus e to the power of z, right? Okay, we can do some simplification on this as well. So we can say that p equals, let's multiply both of them, e to the power of minus z, okay, such that we would have 1 over 1, okay, it would be 1 over e to the power of minus z, okay, plus e to the power of z multiplied by e to the power of minus z, which is 1, okay, so this would be 1 over 1, which is this one, okay, plus e to the power of minus z. And this would be our activation function. This would be our equation. So our equation would be p equals 1 over 1 plus e to the power of minus z. Okay, and we can call this, it's called the sigmoid activation function. Okay, let's think about this for a moment. Okay, so we now have an equation. It should take the value of z, map it to phi of z. Let's see if it really achieves what we wanted it to achieve. We take a value from minus infinity to infinity and it should be mapped to zero and one. So let's take z to be minus infinity and substitute in this equation. Okay, so it would be e to the power of infinity, right? Because it's minus infinity multiplied by minus, it would be e to the power of infinity. True? Yeah. e to the power of infinity is infinity 1 over infinity would be 0 okay so when z is minus infinity and minus infinity it would be 0 the 5z value would be 0 okay and let's plug in the other value the other extreme infinity it would be e to the power of minus infinity right e to the power of minus infinity is zero, okay? Mm. So this would be zero, so it would be one over one. So it would be one, the value would be one. So the, this is zero and this is one, so the value would be one. So how about something in the middle? Something in the middle, when z is zero, so it's not minus infinity or infinity, it's in the middle, it's zero, okay? So let's plug in the value of 0. So it will be e to the power of 0, which is 1. So it will be 1 plus 1. It will be 2. So it will be over, it will be 1 over 2. It will be half. Okay. And then we can see that the sigmoid function will take this very nice uh, shape. Basically, mapping anything from minus infinity to infinity to a probability that would range from 0 to a 1. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you have any uh, question in this part? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, let me just save this and let's go and continue into the next part, which is something important, which is the cost function. 
If you remember, of course, in other line, we had a cost function and we took the derivative of that cost function in order to do uh, our uh, iterations, to iterate basically and update the weights. So what would be the cost function in here? Actually, people saw that if we take the sigmoid activation function that we just had, this activation function, okay, and we map z to phi of z using this activation function, something weird would happen. If we look at the normal shape of the weight cost relationship, it was following a curve like that, okay? But if we take z, map it to phi of z like that, this is not a linear classifier uh, in that sense because it's now mapping mapping the data to a nonlinear function. It's helping the classifier to get a nonlinear uh, mapping of the features. Okay, it's still linear in what it's doing. It's still multiplication and addition, but it's just mapping the data into a nonlinear. Uh, activation function okay so the issue that we would find that if we used the same cost that we were using the sum squared error cost that it wouldn't be like that so that's for instance for other line okay it would be a curve like that but for logistic regression it could look like this okay it could look like this so this would be the weight cost relationship if we used the sigmoid activation function and the same uh, cost uh, of the sum squared error. Okay, so this actually would bring us to an issue. If we start from this point and we start iterating with gradient descent, you would reach this point and you would have a slope value of zero. But this is a huge problem because then you would stop here and you would find that the slope is zero, so delta w would be zero. And then you would be stuck at this point. You would be stuck at the local uh, minima. Okay, but we really need to skip this. We really need to go to the global minima because that's corresponding to the minimum cost. So we don't need to get stuck at this uh, local uh, minima. Okay, so what people were thinking about is to change the cost function itself. Okay, instead of having the sum squared error, okay, let's have some different cost function for the logistic regression. Okay, and from that we can actually bring a mathematical term that is really uh, good in describing this, which is a convex, convex functions. Okay, we say that a curve or a function is convex if the relationship is looking like this. We can do this, we can say bring or draw two points, okay? And then ask yourself, is your curve always under the line? Okay, so draw two points, any two points. It could be here, it could be here, okay? Draw any two points and just Draw a line between these two points, okay? And ask yourself, is your curve, is your function, is your function always, always underneath this line or not? So what do you think? Is our curve between the two points, our curve between the two points underneath the line? Yeah. Yes. Then we say that this is a convex function. Okay, okay, so let's try to do this here. So let's bring this point and this point. Let's have a line, okay? You see our curve is having a value here and a value there, right? Mm -hmm. So some ports are beneath the line and some of them are beyond the line, right? Yeah. So we say that this is non-convex. Okay, so 
speaking mathematically, we can just say that if you have a weight caused relationship that is convex, then that's really good. And you can go ahead and use your gradient descent and it should be fine. Okay. And if it's non-convex, then you should think about changing the cost of function or a changing gradient itself, it's gradient descent itself, how you are trying to get the, to the global minima. Okay. So people decided to go with the, with the first approach and change the cost of function. Okay. So they thought about a nice cost the function that is called the cross entropy. Cross entropy. Cost the function. Okay. And I would just stop and explain this part. What is entropy? Entropy means the degree of surprise that we have. Okay. Meaning that if I told you that it's 100% that Ali is going to the school tomorrow. So there is probability of one that Ali is going to the school tomorrow. Okay. If you wait until tomorrow and see that Ali is going to the school, do you get any surprise? No. Mm -hmm. No, because you know with a probability of 100% that he's going to the school, right? So when the probability is very high, there is no surprise. The surprise is very low, okay? And when the probability is very low, let's say 0.1. So if I told you it's 0.1 that he's going to the school, so basically 10% chance that he's going to the school if you find that he's in the school tomorrow then you will be surprised because it was very unlikely that he was going to the school right yeah. so there is like this inverse relationship between the two almost okay between the two when the probability is high you are not surprised when the probability is low there is a high surprise okay and that's when we get our um uh, equation so i will put the equation and i will explain every uh, every part of it such that we know what the equation is really doing okay mm. so it would be a cost uh, function one minus y and then there will be a log one minus y hat okay so what this cost of function is doing is basically taking the predicted label, okay, and then doing log on that, and then comparing this to the true label with a negative sign, okay, and then aggregating this between these two ports, this port and this port, okay. Let's see what this is really doing, okay. So basically, we said that the entropy is almost like the inverse of the probability. Okay, so when we have a probability of one, we should have very low surprise. If we have probability of one, the entropy should be almost zero. Okay, so right now I will make use again of the look curve. Again, the look curve was looking like that. Okay, looking like that. Since we are talking about probabilities, then the range that we are talking about is ranging from zero to one. So we are talking about this part here, okay? If I'm taking the, the log of that probability, then I'm projecting on the curve in this part, okay? And that's exactly what I wanted to do. If I have a probability of one, probability of one, log of one will be zero, right? Mm. So that would be, that would be our entropy. So it should be look of the probability, okay? But it would be negative, the look of the probability, and we would see why. So we achieved that log of one will be zero. So when the probability is high, the entropy is zero. So let's say that the probability is 0.1, then we should have high entropy, right? Yeah. But the look curve is here achieving minus infinity, right? Achieving very... Uh, huge but negative value, right? Yeah. 
That's why we are putting this negative, such that this is now infinity instead of minus infinity. Okay, so when we have very low probability, 0.1, this would have a huge surprise, a huge entropy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so right now we can say that this is our entropy minus log p minus log of the probability okay so this actually explains these pores from the equation the negative and the log of y hat okay and the only difference here in this equation that we are comparing this to the true label that's why we are putting y in this part okay and all of this is to explain one of the classes the positive class the class one okay the whole port the whole other port here is the same thing but just one minus uh, the same values to explain the other clause to explain the zero clause what i mean by that we are using this equation in such a way that enables us to just take one side of them at each time meaning that if we say that y equals one so let's say that the true label was one okay then you will be dealing with this side of the equation only why because one minus one one minus y one minus one will be zero so all of this will be eliminated okay true and when y equals zero then y equals zero so all of this side will be eliminated and then you will be just dealing with this side okay so it's a nice equation that will deal with the two possibilities of the true label one and zero okay okay let's now think about different uh, values and see how the cross entropy cost function is achieving this convex functionality and helping us uh, to get an actual cost okay so let's look at this so y equals one okay y equals one what will happen when y equals one and our predicted label y hat y hat equals zero and the sum squared error this would this was bad news because y hat minus y and you have y hat to be zero minus y one then there is an error because this would be one and then we square this then this would mean that there is an error so we need the cost to be high to be high because y hat does not equal y okay so let's see if the cross entropy cost function will achieve this so right now this is our cost okay so y hat equals zero and the true label was one so let's plug this into the equation y hat is zero so it's log of zero what is log of zero log of zero is minus infinity right mm -hmm. log of zero is minus infinity multiplied by this negative okay it will be plus infinity so the cost will be infinity okay so let's try to plot this so that we know what we are uh, dealing with okay so we are uh, plotting y equals one and we have y hat let's say that this is y hat y hat equals zero okay and when y hat equals uh, zero the cost will be infinity so it will be here very high cost so this is this is the cost infinity okay let's see what will happen if y hat equals one when y hat equals one this would mean that it, it equals the true label which is good so the cost should be minimum right so let's see if this is true if y hat equals one then this would be log of one log of one is zero right then this whole term will be zero okay so it will be zero so when y hat equals one this will give us a cost of zero cost of zero so our curve would really look something 
uh, like this. Okay. Let's try the other. Uh, let's try the other port. Let's try the other port. So the other port. So here goes to be zero. Okay. So let's try the other port. When y equals zero, what will happen? When y equals zero, this whole term will disappear, and then we will be dealing with this port, right? So let's take the variations of this port. Okay, so the variation would be that we have, let's draw it with a different color, y hat equals zero and y hat equals one. So one y hat, when y hat equals zero, this would mean that y hat equals y. Both of them, both of them are zeros, right? So we would have zero and zero okay so it will be one minus zero which is one log of one is zero okay multiplied by all of this it will be zero because it's one minus zero and that's negative so all of this will give us zero and that is good because this is the coast, and when both of them are equal, then the coast will be zero. Okay. And in the other case, the coast would be one minus one, would be one minus one. So it will be zero. And log of zero is minus infinity. So it would be minus infinity multiplied by one minus zero multiplied by one. Okay. And then multiplied by this negative, so it will be plus infinity. Okay, so the coast would be plus infinity. So let's plot this. So that's the other curve when y equals zero. Okay, when y hat equals zero, the coast will be zero. When y hat equals zero, the coast will be zero. Coast on the y-axis will be zero. And when y hat equals one, coast will be infinity. When y hat equals one, coast will be infinity. So it will go to infinity. Okay. And this is really good because then any value that you are taking on this curve is following this nice shape. Okay. And we can then go ahead and calculate uh, the coast. Okay. So do you have any questions on this part? No. Okay, that's good. So by doing this, we can actually think right now of having different activation functions. Okay, we can just think about what was happening. We just think about other line that is using a linear activation function. Okay, we took a variation which is a sigmoid, mapping this to probability. We call it the sigmoid. And then we can even use different other activation functions. We can use an activation function that is called ReLU. Okay. And we can use a variation of this rectified linear unit called leaky. Really, you, or we can use something else called Tanich activation function. So the idea is the same. You have Z and you map it to an activation function. All of these are nonlinear, so you can you can see some nonlinearity in your data. It's not. Uh, it's really good that we have this nonlinear activation functions. So the idea is the same. You take z, you map it to phi of z. It's just a variation of the activation function uh, itself, okay? And this would help us to learn new uh, features or new uh, associations in our data, okay? But all of them are coming from the same idea. You have x values, different x uh, features. These x features are going to the weights and multiplied by the weights. And then we sum them together to get the net input z. And then we apply this 
activation uh, function and then we get our uh, predicted labels okay okay so all of this all of this can be summarized and all of this can be seen as just one node we can call all of this as one as one node so all of this classifier all of this classification that was done here we can call this node okay and we can represent it by just one circle okay and if we, if we bring a lot of these nodes and we stack them together we achieve what is called a neural network okay we achieve what is called a layer a layer in this neural network okay if we put another layer if we put other classifiers basically each classifier sees all features so if we have three features here each of the classifiers is seeing uh, the features okay so we say that this is fully connected meaning that all the nodes are connected to each other all of them okay or a dense network all of them are connected to each other okay so if we have a layer like that with a lot of classifiers following this layer we can say that this is a hidden layer so if there is something between what is predicted what is predicted and our input layer we say that this is a hidden layer okay and if we have more than one more than one hidden layer we call this a deep neural network so again all the things that you would hear about like artificial neural network or a deep neural network all of them are coming from what we were just explaining what we were just explaining we were explaining one node okay and if you stack many of these nodes together and you connect them meaning that basically if we apply our activation function 5z and then we take our 5z to be the input to be the input instead of the original feature to be the input to this new classifier if we stack them in this way okay then we would have a deep uh, neural network okay and then how would we go ahead and do our weight update by comparing the value to the predicted value at the end and then we do what is called back propagation back propagation of the weight okay so we basically feed forward we go forward in our uh, calculations okay in our calculations and we back propagate the error that's why such a neural networks are called feed forward back propagation and neural networks okay so to summarize, we have some issues with supervised learning, with uh, machine learning in general. We don't know how to initialize our weights. We don't know where to start, okay? Because we have this weight cost relationship, but we actually don't have this whole, this whole curve. We need to explore it. We need to explore this curve. We don't really know it. That's why we are initializing the weight randomly and then trying to go in the direction that would minimize the cost. Okay. So we have this issue of weight initialization. If we could find a way to initialize the weight, not in a random way, but in a way that will enable us to converge faster, reach the global minima faster, this would be really good. Okay. But the thing is, there are some algorithms for weight initialization, but still, it's an issue that initialization is not very straightforward. It's very difficult. In the meantime, we need to explore this um, space. We don't know when we will get to the global minima. And we need to specify the learning rate, our steps. Okay. 
the variables that will help us to do our stepping instead of just overshooting the global minima or uh, undershooting the minima and not just uh, achieving the minima at all. Okay. So do you have any questions in these uh, parts? Okay, so I would like to show you uh, the logistic regression uh, code. I would like to have a look at the logistic regression code together, such that we know how it's it's implemented. And it's quite uh, nice, actually, and straightforward, I hope, because there are uh, not a lot of variations from uh, something like uh, other line. Okay. So I will basically take some code from other line and we will just focus on the changes uh, between them. So I will take uh, a port in which uh, we um, we just generated our data and we specified the learning rate and the total uh, total epochs. And then we will go ahead and see how uh, to implement this. Okay, so we also had this part here. We just didn't have an activation function and the error was different. We had an activation function. It was just i uh, of z equals, uh, it was equal to z. And that was our uh, other line algorithm. Okay, and then we were just visualizing uh, the data at the end and here I added uh, a port for testing uh, our data so can you see uh, the screen no. is the code uh, obvious mm. okay so if you remember here we were just generating our data and we were standardizing our data subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation and then here I was just visualizing uh, the uh, points. So if we run this, this would just visualize our scattered uh, points. Okay, so this is not different from other line. So the same thing that we were doing. The difference would be inside of this uh, loop. Okay, inside of this loop. So we are still doing Z. We are taking W transpose multiplying this by x and then adding the bytes and here we would have our uh, activation function okay so it should be one uh, plus one um, would be one over one plus e to the power of minus uh, z right and this should be uh, our activation uh, function okay so this should be phi of z that we have right now so the only change from other line is the activation function as we said okay it will be sigmoid and the cost of function is uh, cross entropy so here we should be uh, putting the code for uh, cross entropy okay so here we can uh, just say that the error could equal, so we could calculate this error for every uh, epoch, okay? And the error would be the same as the equation, right? The equation of the cost function. So the equation of the cost function was this equation, minus y log y hat minus uh, this uh, part. So let's use this, so it would be minus, minus y, Log the predicted value, which is i of z, because that's our predicted value. Okay, minus one minus y, the true label, multiplied by one minus log of what one minus i i of z. 
okay because again that's our predicted value so i'm basically using the equation nothing nothing fancy i'm just uh, using the equation uh, of the coast and then from the equation as well we have one over m we're just taking the average you are summing all of this we're adding these together because we are having this from all trials from all uh, samples so we add them together and then we divide by their number okay so i can just put mean and this would add them and divide by their uh, number okay and then here we're just taking the weight and updating the weight in the same way okay and the bias as well okay and we could actually stop here and say why this is looking like this okay why this is looking like this it should be a little bit different from that because if we think about it then we would uh, see that uh, our costa function is different so the derivative of the costa function could be different right because our weight update was relative or it was the slope it was the derivative of the costa function and now we have a different costa function but the thing is and this is actually a practice that you can do uh, yourself if you take the derivative of that costa function of that costa function that we put here it would give you the same weight update that we used with other line that's why I will not change these two lines because it will give us the same uh, derivative. Okay. Okay, that's good. Now you have the weight update, you have the bias, and you can just iterate, iterate, and uh, finish the number of epochs that you have. And then we can do uh, our testing. So if we finish the number of uh, epochs, then we would have our final weight and bias and in these lines i was testing my data and i was testing my data with the same uh, with the same data i was testing the data with the same training samples so basically i was just projecting x values the same of the training data using the final w and bias uh, values after finished the iterations okay and after doing that, we would have uh, our z value. And then from having z value, we go ahead and do our activation function. So it will be 1 over 1 plus e to the power of minus z. That's what I'm doing here. This would be our y predicted. And as we said, because we are talking about probability, so anything higher than 0 0.5 will be considered as a true level of 1. Anything lower, then 0.5 will be less label of zero. And here I'm calculating the accuracy. So I'm taking the value from y nu, if it's equal to y, okay, and then I'm summing all of this and dividing by the number of samples that we have to get an accuracy. And just multiplying this by 100, okay? And here I'm just taking, again, this part from the other line algorithm, where we were plotting the separating uh, line okay between the data okay so if we go ahead and run uh, this part we would find that we would have a nice uh, separation uh, in our data so if we took these uh, lines okay and we think about every error. And here, by the way, we didn't explain this part. So here is the tolerance. The tolerance means that uh, we have um, we have a small value for the error. Okay, because we know that the value that we have is a probability. So it should not or it may not match the exact label of our data okay so our error will always be there it's very unlikely that it's exactly uh, zero okay so some of the time uh, it may be uh, almost zero or a very uh, small uh, value for the error 
Okay. Okay, I think uh, that's good. So let's let's revise this equation because I think there is uh, an error with it because this is a minus y log y hat and this one minus y log one uh, minus uh, y hat, okay? And we can actually uh, verify this. So let's look at the equation again. It's minus y log y hat minus y log y hat minus one minus y log one minus y hat. Okay, okay, this sounds good. So let's run this. And if we run that, it will produce these two figures. The first figure with the decision boundary nicely uh, separating our data. So that's now logistic regression okay and the second figure that i was plotting is actually the error uh, with the increasing number of epochs okay so with the first iterations we still have random weights that's why the error will be high so in the beginning of the epochs the error is high and when we increase the number of epochs you would see how nicely the error is bringing down up until the point it's almost zero Okay, so do you have any questions in these two uh, figures? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I hope that the idea is clear now. And if we look at the accuracy, if we look at the predicted and the, the true, it should be matching. So this accuracy, if we run this port, the accuracy is 100%. Okay, because it's classifying all of our uh, samples correctly you wouldn't see any um, any mistakes in this okay if i run this for multiple times because i was initializing this randomly you would see that the accuracy would be a bit different so here it's 99 uh, percent let's run it another time and see the figure so this one is not making any mistakes so it should be 100 percent so the accuracy here is 100 percent that is correct okay so this is the implementation of the logistic regression all of this again all of this is representing one node that can be blocked into a neural network okay and then with the neural network or with these nodes you can just change this activation function to something of your liking, something that you like, something like a radio or another activation function, and you can use different cost functions uh, as well. Okay. Okay. So, do you have any questions in today's lecture? That's uh, everything I wanted to say. Uh, no. Okay. So, uh, thanks and. We will meet again. I think it wouldn't be uh, next week, okay? But we will continue talking about this uh, classifiers and we will see how we can use some variations also from uh, gradient descent and how we can do our optimization and do our conversions and achieve very good classification accuracy much faster than just using uh, gradient descent, okay? Okay. Okay, um, thanks a lot for listening and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. Okay, bye.